you made the time this evening to come here today and uh, listen to my colleague and friend, David White. Um, these, this lecture series really came out of um, uh, attending the Northern New England chapter of American Planning Association's uh, conference last fall was in Burlington, Vermont. And, you know, we're really inspired by a lot of the great things that are happening in Burlington. And so Anya and I kind of put our heads together and we came up with this lecture series. And uh, so we're really excited to have uh, David with us. Uh, David has been a public sector urban planner, um, working on local and regional level for more than 30 years. For 26 plus years, he worked for the city of Burlington, Vermont. That is Vermont's largest city with a population of about 44,000 people nestled on the Eastern shore of Lake Champlain. He was the director of planning from 2007 to 2021 and the city's comprehensive planner from 1995 to 2007. In his service to the city, David played a leading role in securing Burlington's place as one of the country's most celebrated, progressive, livable, and dynamic small cities. David was admitted to the American Institute of Certified Planners, um, which is the professional institute of the American Planning Association in 1997, and is a past president of Northern New England chapter of APA. In 2016, he was recognized by the Vermont Planners Association as their Mark Bluche. Professional Planner of the Year, and in 2018, he was inducted into the AICP College of Fellows, the highest honor the American Institute of Certified Planners bestows upon a member. He has a master's degree from Duke University School of Environmental and Earth Science and a bachelor's degree in geography from the University of Vermont. So thank you, David, and take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Anne and Anya. Really uh, happy to be here. Let me uh, try to get my screens up and running. <clears throat> and let's see here. So as I often say, you know, whenever you're performing with children, animals, or technology, something is bound to go wrong. So I am That's all right. trying to get my wife's computer to play nice. I'm not sure why that is. So I'm going to uh, go to plan B here. I'm going to skip out and come back in uh, on a different computer. So bear me with me one moment. That's okay. While we're waiting for David, I'll just um, talk a little bit about the um, comprehensive plan. Um, you know, we're in this, the, in this period right now in the planning process where the consultants have been working on assembling all of the data chapters. Those are the, the chapters that kind of take that snapshot of the city in all aspects of the city. And then um, while they're doing that, you know, again, Anya and I were saying, well, you know, we need to keep going with our public outreach. And, you know, we had just finished the economic development strategy in December. So again, we were trying to figure out what could we do to still engage the public and talk about different things and see what other communities are doing that's working well for them. And so again, when we were in Burlington last fall, there's just so many great things you know, happening over there. And Burlington, I mean, it's a very different um, city in terms of how it's structured and built than Bangor, but it does have a lot of um, similar issues that they deal with, just like we do with housing and 
you know, having a, a healthy downtown and things like that. So it's, um, we're all kind of in the same boat. And so I was really grateful that uh, David agreed to, to come here. So hopefully he'll be able to get um, his slideshow up and running. Oh, and here he comes again. All right, can you hear me okay? Yep. All right, so let's try this again. David, when you hit shared screen, it, there should be some choices that automatically pop up for you to hit on. Is that not happening? Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> ah, there you go. Hey, can you see that? I sure can. Take it away. All right. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Things never go as planned, right? And particularly in this work from home environment, you know, we're all working on uh, various uh, hodgepodges of equipment. So uh, thank you again for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I really love talking about downtowns and particularly this downtown is a, is a place that uh, I'm particularly passionate about. So uh, I'm excited to be able to do that. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about Burlington's history in um, creating and maintaining one of the country's most successful and enduring uh, uh, pedestrian markets places um, uh, and some of the challenges that we've confronted over the years, some of the ways that we've tried to address them. Um, and at the end, kind of talk a little bit about what I see as being some of the, the key ingredients to any sort of uh, downtown pedestrian, downtown public space uh, for them to be successful. So uh, the Church Street Marketplace is often referred to as the gem in the crown uh, of the Queen City. So Burlington is known as the Queen City of Vermont, uh, and this is certainly a centerpiece uh, of, of that Queen City. Um, of about 200 different pedestrian areas that have been created around the country since the 1960s, there are only about 30 left. Um, and uh, Burlington and a handful of others are amongst kind of the most successful and most celebrated. Um, we see on the order of uh, a million and a half visitors every year, um, particularly through this, the beautiful summer months, of course, uh, but right up through the holidays, which is some of, uh, some of our busiest time. There are plus or minus 110, 115 businesses uh, at any given time um, open on the marketplace. About 70% of them are retail. Uh, and about 70% of them are locally owned, which is a really important uh, factor for us. Or, um, we have very low vac vacancy rates, uh, less than 5% at any given time. There may be one or two uh, business uh, shop fronts that are, that are vacant at any uh, point in time, but it's usually in a period of transition uh, between one um, business uh, on to the next. Um, it's the most valuable commercial real estate in the state um, and generates a fair amount of tax revenue um, in uh, rooms and meals, uh, alcohol sales, meals, uh, not so much sales tax because we don't tax uh, food, uh, clothing and shoes. So that kind of uh, retail activity um, doesn't generate taxes, but um, it's, it's economically quite vibrant. Um, it's really an international destination. Our Canadian friends to the north absolutely love coming to the Church Street Marketplace. They are uh, a dominant force. Uh, you hear uh, uh, French being spoken pretty regularly up and down the marketplace. And certainly when the border was, was closed, we felt that, we noticed that, um, that loss of visitation. Um, it's kind of Burlington's living room. Um, it's a venue for large events uh, beginning in May um, with uh, Vermont City Marathon, 
um, uh, for Discover Jazz Festival right on through uh, the summer. Almost every weekend, there's some sort of a festival or event going on on the marketplace and in the downtown um, right up through the holiday season. Um, um, and it's really a model that's emulated by, by many people around the country. Um, we often are entertaining uh, guests coming to look and see and experience the marketplace and get a little bit of a better understanding about what is it uh, and what is it that really makes it work. Um, these two pictures just show kind of the evolution from 1962 on the left to 2018 on the right, where you can really see uh, um, that before and after uh, of what the, the Church Street Marketplace um, looks like and feels like today. Um, <clears throat> And it's really been, uh, like many things in Burlington, uh, an incremental process. Um, the first vision and ideas for some sort of uh, uh, pedestrian area uh, go back to the 1960s. Um, and it wasn't until 1971 where uh, we had an experimental weekend where the street was closed, businesses could spill out onto the sidewalk into the street, and people could really see how might this work. What would this feel like? Um, it, would, it was a wild success. Um, in 1979, the voters were asked to approve a charter change and a one and a half million dollar bond uh, for the capital improvements. Uh, that funding was then uh, coupled with about five and a half million dollars of federal funds uh, in order to uh, build out the first two blocks of the marketplace. Um, so the street was first closed to traffic in 1980 uh, in the middle two blocks uh, between College and Cherry Street. The Marketplace District itself was actually created in uh, 1981. Um, it, was, it was another 14 years later, uh, 1994, where the top block, the northernmost block, was closed to traffic. Um, and more recently, uh, 2005, where the southernmost block was closed to traffic. At each step of the way, uh, we heard the same concerns. We faced the same challenges uh, in thinking about closing off another uh, section of our downtown uh, to, vi to vehicles. Um, primarily what we often hear about making any sort of changes in our downtown is a concern about a uh, loss of parking uh, and an impact on the traffic pattern. Um, where's the money gonna come from for the capital improvements? Uh, fortunately, we've been very successful at uh, getting uh, state and federal funding to help um, cover many of the capital improvements that you see in the marketplace. Um, but there's a concern about the, the cost burden on the, the businesses, which ultimately, ultimately uh, have to pay the common area fee uh, that helps support the, the marketplace operations. Um, many businesses uh, initially are very concerned about um, how are they going to be able to, you know, get services and delivery and if the streets close that you know, a restaurant needs to steam clean their, their vents. How's that going to happen? And, you know, it's all been worked out as part of the day-to-day -day operations of how the marketplace functions. Uh, the street's not closed all the time. The street's actually open uh, in the early morning hours uh, up until, I think it's 10 o'clock uh, for service vehicles and delivery vehicles uh, on the marketplace so that um, all the businesses kind of have what they need. Um, there's always a concern about a loss of independence, you know, businesses wanting to be able to do what they do when they want to do it um, and not want to have to coordinate with uh, uh, their neighbors. Um, and a concern about a perception of city control because the Church Street Marketplace is a city department or is operated by a city department that, again, this loss of independence uh, for those businesses um, has been an initial concern um, for, for each one that. Uh, kind of enters into this, um, this framework. Um, so, you know, there is a bit of a magic sauce uh, here uh, that makes so much of this work. And I'd say it really begins with location, location, location. Um, many of the most successful uh, downtown pedestrian spaces around the country um, are in college towns, uh, places where there's, you know, a, a, already a, quite a dynamic energy. Um, our marketplace is about 1,600 feet from end to end, four city blocks. Uh, so it's about a five to 10 minute walk from one end to the other. So it's very manageable. 
um, and it's very navigable. And it kind of sits right in the middle of things. It's right in the middle of our downtown, but the, the distance from one end of the marketplace to the other is the same distance from the marketplace down to the waterfront. Um, so again, a very easy walk. You know, it's a little bit farther to get up to the university on the hill, but not by much. It's still within a 10 or 15 minute walk. But, but in fact, there is a high frequency free shuttle that runs up and down um, from the hospital and the university all the way to the waterfront every day so that uh, helps to move people around. So those are really important factors. <clears throat> but there's also, you know, the thing that draws people to a, to a place. You know, there is a there there. Um, it has authenticity. It, it's real. Um, and it's got great architecture and history, just like every almost every other downtown across northern New England, um, uh, yours included. Um, the business mix, um, it's a mix of national and locals, um, is a mix of retail and hospitality. Uh, it's a mix of those businesses that are kind of more oriented towards the visitor and the tourist. Uh, versus the, the resident and the downtown worker. Um, there's a fine grained nature to this street, um, both in fairly small shop fronts, um, not large expanses of large department stores, but small shop fronts and lots of architectural detail on the buildings. Um, and there are a lot of the infrastructure and the amenities on the street, again, add to that granularity, add to that kind of sense of kind of high quality, high design with uh, lots of benches for people to sit on, uh, pedestrian scale lighting, uh, trees that provide wonderful shade, rocks that kids love to climb on, sculptures that people love to uh, take pictures uh, of and with, uh, and uh, the, the brick walking service, which uh, to be honest with you is a bit of a plus minus sometimes because uh, it's a bit of a maintenance uh, challenge sometimes to maintain or, or has been over the years to maintain those bricks. And all this means is then lots of people. And, you know, as humans, we are social creatures and there is no better place to see and be seen than the Church Street Marketplace. And particularly when there's a major event or festival going on, uh, like the Festival of Fools uh, image on the left hand side where uh, we have buskers and, and uh, entertainers from around the world doing uh, all kinds of uh, uh, street entertainment um, uh, over the course of a long weekend. Or one of our largest events, uh, the lighting of the Christmas tree in the top block uh, of Thanksgiving weekend. There's also a magic sauce that goes on behind the scenes, though, that <clears throat> really is what makes this place tick on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it is a business improvement district and it has a dedicated funding source. Um, all of the properties um, that are on the marketplace um, pay about $2.78 per square feet uh, in a common area fee. Uh, that generates about 70% of the approximately million dollar budget uh, of the Church Street Marketplace. Um, and the rest of that funding comes from uh, other fees that they charge for street vendors, for outdoor dining, for uh, permits, for sandwich board signs, uh, rent for a couple of small kiosks that, that are within the public right of way. Um, it's run by a city department um, as a staff of five dedicated to, to maintenance and permitting and, and programming and marketing. Um, and it's overseen by the Church Street Marketplace Commission. Um, in Burlington, we have lots of boards and commissions that serve uh, basically every municipal function we have from fire and police to the library to, to the planning commission. Um, they're all appointed by the city council to three year terms and they represent business owners, uh, property owners, uh, citizens uh, and the like, <clears throat> excuse me, and help to really facilitate that coordination and cooperation amongst businesses which is really important um, that, again, there are common hours. Uh, people open at about the same time and they close at about the same time. Um, that way there is some consistency in what the public can expect when they come to visit us. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but even after 40 years, 
the Church Street Marketplace remains a work in progress. Um, funding for capital improvements is a particular issue. Um, as part of the charter that was approved when the district was created, uh, we can't use any general fund dollars uh, to support uh, the work of the marketplace. So they really are financially self-sustaining. Um, so they, when there is a large capital project, a capital need, um, they have to go out and find their own sources. Um, like I said, we've been very successful at being able to do that, uh, but that gets harder and harder every year. Um, like every downtown, uh, regional and online competition for shopping is a challenge, but again, what we offer here is an experience, uh, the, not just the ability to be able to kind of see and touch and try on uh, a product, but to actually kind of do it in a place where you're, you're out and about, you're walking around, there's a place to have lunch, there's a, um, maybe some live music that's being played outside, uh, there's some sort of an event going on. So there's much more to it than you get uh, from your Amazon shopping cart. <clears throat> Balancing the business mix, there's uh, always a concern about having uh, too many national retailers uh, and not enough local retailers. And we've been pretty successful, as I said, in maintaining that. Um, but again, that's something to always be aware of. Um, the transitions to adjacent blocks, you know, once you step off the marketplace onto a side street, you know, within the first 50 feet, uh, all of the signature amenities are gone, the street lighting, the brick paving, and you're back on to, you know, a downtown street. And it's not always uh, as attractive as attractive as we want it to be. Um, and as those businesses on those side streets would like it to be. Um, they want to be part of the action um, for the most part. Uh, and they want to be able to benefit from the marketplace. But um, how we expand that and how do we uh, preserve the marketplace for what it is, yet expand that vitality uh, throughout the downtown is, uh, again, another balancing act. Um, social behaviors and perceptions of public safety uh, is always a big issue uh, in the downtown. I dare say it's been an increasingly issue, increasingly large issue uh, over the past couple of years. Um, but we actually have what is called the street outreach team which are social workers uh, provided under contract uh, from a local so social service agency uh, that are out on the street every day, interacting with uh, many of our kind of local uh, color uh, that's out there um, and kind of helping to engage them, helping to uh, find services and, and uh, help them to address some of their needs uh, and help to diffuse uh, any sort of uh, uh, tensions that may arise over the course of the day. Um, that's a really important asset to us uh, and they are critical uh, in supporting the work uh, of the businesses uh, in here as well as the, the police department. Um, there's really a need for a larger uh, economic development strategy uh, and marketing strategies across the city um, often that burden falls to the Church Street Marketplace, um, and the city really needs to, to kind of be able to look uh, and, and have better programming, have better resources and staffing to, to do that on a broader level. So that, that's a major challenge. And as with every other downtown um, that is successful, uh, perceptions about traffic and parking. Um, crossing the marketplace uh, in a vehicle is a challenge on the cross streets, um, and but parking really isn't. Um, we have a parking problem, but it's not the kind of parking problem that you think. Um, that image I showed you of the lighting of the Christmas tree, a block away, um, I park in a virtually empty city parking garage, despite the fact that there were hundreds and hundreds of people out in the marketplace. We have plenty of parking spaces downtown. The problem is they're not easy to find. Uh, we don't market them well, we don't manage them well. Um, and that's really been a big focus for the city over the last several years is uh, trying to do a better job of managing both public and private uh, parking spaces uh, throughout the downtown. 
oh, it's here. I didn't realize they put this slide in. So this is that parking garage uh, with all of these people out on the street. <clears throat> so when we talk about uh, these kinds of places, um, there's so many successful examples all around the country. You know, these downtown pedestrian spaces can come in, in many different shapes and sizes. They can be a linear connection like Church Street, um, a street, an alley, a sidewalk, a uh, river walk, a trail. Um, these images happen to be of uh, Pearl Street in Boulder, Colorado, and very similar uh, to Church Street, um, where uh, you can see uh, brick pavers, pedestrian scale lighting, lots of uh, lots of vegetation, um, fountains, uh, even playgrounds. Um, and I mentioned this because uh, having attractions, having amenities that uh, attract a diverse number of people uh, is really important. Um, and playgrounds provide a place for uh, folks with kids uh, to be active and engaged, maybe while somebody else is shopping inside. Um, and having a downtown area that is that feels both attractive and safe uh, to single women and mothers with children is really a signature. Um, those are the kinds of places that are truly successful. Um, if, if a mom is willing to bring their kids downtown, uh, then you know that it's a it's a safe and comfortable, vibrant place to be. Um, Downtown spaces like this can also be a single fo uh, focal point uh, destination. Um, in, these, in these images, uh, the newly renovated Burlington City Hall Park, where <clears throat> we have beautiful um, plantings. These are in fact, uh, stormwater gardens, uh, splash fountains, benches, again, lots of lighting, uh, places for people to gather and sit on the grass, uh, a site for our, um, Saturday farmer's market, um, and even a place for my grandson to dance around when the fountains aren't running. So some of the basic characteristics that I think are really essential to making these kinds of places work is first, there's gotta be a there there. Um, it may already exist or maybe you create it, but a reason why people wanna go there. Um, and that reason can be wide ranging. It doesn't have to be a shopping district per se, it could be a trail. Um, it could be a scenery, but there have to be things that are, uh, that are kind of cultivated and, and presented uh, in such a way that people are excited about going and visiting them and experiencing them. Um, the diversity of that experience is really important. Again, you've got multiple generations, multiple interests. Uh, you wanna to try to engage as many people as possible. Um, and also particularly in a downtown environment, having uh, a wide mixture of uses and activities, you know, housing and offices and shops and entertainment, that vibrant mix is really critical because you don't want to have a place, or at least in Burlington, we don't want our downtown to be a place that is, a, that is primarily focused on, on tourists. It is a place that is designed, planned, uh, and managed for residents of Burlington, for residents of Vermont and Chippen County. And the fact that it has that level of authenticity is what makes it so attractive uh, to people from everywhere else. Um, the compactness of the space or the density of the space is really important. Um, it's achieved through creating enclosure by, by having uh, you know, a fairly narrow uh, New England street with you know, three and four story buildings along either side. Uh, it makes a much more comfortable physical environment uh, for people. But that also can be achieved through uh, our urban street tree canopy um, that creates that enclosure. Um, and high, high quality of design and high quality of, of materials and amenities, uh, again, make that space inviting and attractive for people to come, for people to linger, uh, and for events and activities to take place. <clears throat> Clean and safe is a fundamental program of any successful downtown uh, marketplace district, uh, downtown district, pedestrian district, wh whatever. Again, a place, making a place with an eye towards making it appealing and comfortable for single women and moms with children. Um, that's kind of the gold standard. You're creating, you add more eyes on the street. Um, 
You might have ambassadors or foot patrols that are there uh, to help uh, answer people's questions. You have regular daily maintenance, durable and repairable finishes. Um, just because it's really pretty, you got to make sure that you can maintain it uh, on a week to week and month to month basis. That's really important. Um, and it needs to be celebrated. It needs to be in the public eye and on their radar screen. So um, folks that maybe live just outside of town are thinking about, oh, there's this thing that goes on uh, downtown that I want to go and check out. Um, it may be a, an annual event. It may be a special event. But those things that, that keep people coming back. Uh, or maybe bring in somebody new that will then come back again. Um, and one of the most critical elements, certainly for us here in Burlington, is that teamwork and cooperation uh, across city departments uh, that, are, that um, all pitch in to help make the marketplace work, uh, to celebrate the marketplace, to help uh, find funds for it, to help write grant applications for it. Um, the relationship between the, the public and private sector, a relationship amongst the businesses uh, to be willing to cooperate and collaborate um, is are all really critical elements uh, to making a, any sort of a successful downtown. And with that, I'm happy to stop sharing my screen and engage in a conversation and answer people's questions. Yeah. Um if folks do have a question, you can use the raise hand function uh, to ask your question. And while you're assembling your thoughts, um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. The one thing, um, when you were talking about um, this, the economic sustainability of the organization itself, so it's a, so it functions like a special fund in the city. Is that correct? Okay. So it's right. not like a, a private non- yeah. Okay. Special assessment district. So if they get um, a state grant, you know, like a DOT grant or, or something like that, that requires a match, they use their own funds for that match, nothing from the city. That's correct. They use the money from their special assessment or maybe from the fees that they generate. Um, there's also a marketplace foundation, which is a 501c3 that was created to kind of help them raise and uh, raise money, you know, from other sources, yeah. philanthropic sources. <clears throat> but yes, they, they're they prohibited by the charter from using general fund dollars. Wow. Which is a challenge. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Because um, that's a lot of services that are required with the, um, you know, just the trash and and police and everything else. So, so again, this is where, again, they can't use general fund dollars, so they have to do everything themselves. Right. Um, they have to clear their own snow. Department right. of Public Works does not clear the snow here. Um, we've recently, kind of pre-COVID, kind of been through a fairly extended uh, conversation about uh, possible changes to the structure and organization of the marketplace uh, in order to give it some greater flexibility that would allow the Burlington Electric Department to maintain the streetlights, you know, the Public Works Department to, uh, to collect trash, you know, just some of those basic things so that it doesn't all fall to the marketplace. Now that we know, hey, this novel crazy idea, you know, eh, I think it's got legs. Let's, let's run with it. Yeah. So now when they're looking at when they're looking for new businesses, a, a vacancy, um, you know, do they talk about like you, you mentioned a little bit about, you know, diversity of shopping options. Do they actively pursue, you know, say, oh, we need a bakery down here or we need a florist over here. Do they actively find people or. So I, I don't believe the marketplace staff spends a lot of time doing that kind of curating. Um, <clears throat> it's helpful that the chair of the marketplace, longtime chair of the marketplace is a commercial broker. Oh, that is helpful. Uh, so he's very in tune uh, with kind of what the needs are and, uh, and certainly the the marketplace commission isn't shy and the staff isn't shy about when an opening comes up about 
you know, what thoughts they might have and helping to maybe run down some leads, but they don't actively curate that. Um, they're, that's where the, the fact that the city really needs to have a kind of dedicated economic development focus uh, would yeah. be really beneficial here uh, to help facilitate facilitate that because there are just some basic everyday needs that a community has that you want to be sure are in your downtown, you know, a hardware store or a place to get some of the stuff you would typically get in a hardware store, you know, a grocery store. We're, we're fortunate to have both of those things in our downtown, but yep. they're not on the marketplace. They're close. Uh, but that's been a huge lift for the city to try to facilitate that. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Um, kind of building on that though. So when, what's the process exactly for a business to open up on the marketplace? Do they have to go before this commission to get approval to open up there or? Nope, not at all. They, uh, <clears throat> they um, go through the normal permitting process of the city as a whole, if they need to. I mean, uh, most of the businesses that uh, are and would be located downtown really wouldn't require any sort of a new zoning pit permit. They're all, you know, retail uses are permitted, restaurants are permitted, the, you know, typical services are permitted. So, you know, they're going to get a permit from uh, our inspection, uh, permitting and inspections department for a new sign, uh, maybe some changes to the shop front that they might want to make. Uh, mm -hmm. But other than that, uh, they don't get permission from the marketplace district itself. That's for sure. Oh, so they so don't have like a design review of any of that or just beyond just a permit. Right. So if, if there are changes to the shop front or, you know, to the building, it's any exterior changes to the building that'll go through the zoning permit process and the building permit process, mm -hmm. um, which under our form based code is all done administratively. There is some collaboration uh, with the, the marketplace um, in kind of commenting on the design, but uh, it, it happens in a pretty straightforward manner and, and kind of always have, even before our phone race code. That's cool. Um, anybody have any questions? Use your raise hand function and we can pull you over. The raise hand function is at the bottom of your screen, if you hover along the bottom of your screen, you'll see the raise hand and you can hit it. I was really fascinated by the um, stormwater garden. Anya and I were just talking offhand uh, this afternoon about pollinator gardens. And, and so, so when I saw your stormwater garden, I said, oh, I've, I gotta write that down too. <laughs> it's something that we should think about throughout the city. Certainly, it, it serves both functions, right? You know, with the right collection of plants, you are, uh, you're serving the pollinators as well as managing stormwater. Um, that was a big focus, certainly in City Hall Park, uh, but also in the street improvements that we did on St. Paul Street, which is adjacent. Um, yeah. It really is, little in the way of those kind of stormwater improvements in the Church Street Marketplace, although it would benefit from them uh, in a few lo locations, but um, space is a premium, uh, particularly, you know, just space for pedestrians to walk. Uh, there's, and there's just from a, a logistical perspective, you know, within that right of way, there is, whether or not it's, it's, noticeable at any given time there's always something like a 50 foot path running up and down the middle of the marketplace uh, so that a fire truck or an ambulance could easily get in there if they needed to mm -hmm. that's a good point you know having that access and i assume deliveries are early morning or evening requirements yep. yeah yep the uh the the bollards at the end of the of each block uh, are down. I don't know what time they come down uh, in the early morning or late at night, but uh, they're down until about 10 o'clock in the morning. So you regularly see service vehicles, uh, delivery vehicles um, up and down the street, uh, taking care of all of that kind of business. 
That's great. I mean, you know, because in this, even, um, you know, with distribution issues, you, you have UPS coming all the time, you know, into neighborhoods. So that's great that that's able to be coordinated, you know. And, and during COVID, with kind of a greater demand for kind of curbside uh, activities where, you know, people needed to be able to you know, stop to be able to run in to pick up something. You know, we dedicated a lot more parking and curbside space on the side streets uh, to, to make that easier. Some of mm -hmm. these businesses have more or less functional um, rear access. You know, some, some of it's pretty tight, some of it's a little bit more open. Uh, so being able to get in from the front, uh, at least during a certain time of day, coordinating that, um, those pickups and deliveries uh, is beneficial to everyone. Again, you don't have it just happening at random times during the day. Right. That's great that you were able to pivot that, you know, quickly during when the pandemic first came on. Came on. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Yeah. All right. Does anybody have any questions? I'm not seeing any hands up. It's because you're so overwhelmed. <laughs> it is it's awesome. It, it is awesome. And, you know, and I've, I've, I've certainly done, it's been a while since I've been through Bangor, uh, but, you know, just kind of Googling around, there's so many great opportunities, you know, for uh, just activating, whether it's spaces along either of the riverfronts that you have. I mean, you've got a lot of water, uh, yeah. you've got great bones in your downtown and, you know, whether the streets are closed to traffic, open to traffic, there's just, there's a lot of great stuff there. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of that, okay. Yeah. Will has a question. I was just going to ask um, if anybody thinks this could be applied in Bangor, but um, we'll go ahead. Hi, this is actually Bristol. I'm, I'm speaking for both of us. Um, quick question about if the organization doesn't have that kind of veto power for which businesses are coming in, like if they don't have to go through a permitting process in front of the commission, how do you ensure an equal balance between businesses that are tourist focused and businesses that focus on amenities for local um, citizens? You know, that's a great question. And there is no, there's no mechanism to absolutely ensure it. Um, it's something that happens simply by nature. Um, part of it, I think, is dictated in many ways by the physical configuration of the spaces. As I mentioned, a lot of the shop fronts um, are fairly small. Um, larger national retailers want uh, larger spaces. Um, so, you know, you're not going to see, you know, some of the really big chains that don't get that same linear square uh, linear footage of, of of street front that the, they their kind of metrics and models require them to have um, that then really helps facilitate the space for for small local businesses it also makes those spaces because those spaces are small they're more affordable uh, to small local businesses if they're really big the only folks folks that can afford to pay you know that you know the 15 or $20 per square foot are gonna be uh, those mm -hmm. national retailers. So um, it's luck uh, and it's form uh, kind of working together. Thank you, I appreciate that. Anya, what were you gonna add? You had a question. I just kind of wanted to, you know, kind of get the attendees opinion on whether this is something Bangor should look into, or if um, anybody has any ideas for places in Bangor they think would be appropriate, try and spur some conversation. Okay, we have um, Dominic and then Thomas. I'll let Dominic go first. Hey, Dominic. Hi, how are you? Could you hear me? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, David, thank you so much for this presentation. It really did blow me away. It, it, you did an excellent job in Burlington. I, unfortunately, I've never been, and I definitely have been wanting to go, so I will certainly, my partner and I will visit it. But great presentation, but in answer to Anya's um, question, 
Um, I moved to Bangor, uh, West Market Square was already designed and, and built. And I'm just always wondered, and I think I know the reason why we kept that Broad Street Road going through it and we couldn't close it off and create a wonderful, it's small. I mean, the length of that um, area would be probably about 150 feet that they would have closed off that road, but it would just would continue the sidewalk along Main Street without having to cross it and go into West Market Square. So I bet I'm wondering if it was because uh, business owners primarily were frightened about uh, that entry point being closed. We have three other entry points into that area. Yeah, access is always, I'm sure David, that was, dealt, that was a big topic of discussion in the initial conversations is that access. How do you get through it? I guess that's my question, David, also, is that that must have been, what was the first reaction and how how did you work through it? Well, I think, you know, the initial reaction is that, well, if you close the, the street, you know, people can't drive by and see my business. You know, therefore, they're not going to stop and go and shop there. Well, there are other ways to to. Uh, address that issue is that you could have a lot more people walking by that business who are much more likely to stop and go inside uh, on that kind of moment's notice as they come upon you than they're than are ever going to be able to do that as they drive by in a car. Um, so you see so much more pedestrian traffic or even bicycle traffic in some areas uh, where it really improves the business climate so much more than the, the automobile experience. Um, and it never ceases to amaze me to see businesses that are either out in the middle of nowhere or in some back alley or back corner of your downtown that are raging successes. Um, they don't have any street presence. They don't have any uh, parking spaces right in front of them, but you know what? They offer an awesome product or service and everybody wants to go there. So if you're delivering something that everybody wants, they will come and find you. Um, you don't need to have those vehicles there. Uh, and it adds so much more to the vibrancy to then again, be able to walk by experience, you know, the window shopping. You know, one of the challenges that we have in a lot of New England communities is that our rights of way are pretty narrow. Our sidewalks are pretty narrow. Um, so if you want to allow those businesses to spill outside, everybody loves to, loves to dine outside. Everybody loves the sidewalk shopping sales. You know, you need some space to do it. And, I'll, and you know, some of us uh, do this by uh, taking over parking spaces and creating little parklets. Uh, and, you know, ultimately closing off the whole street is just kind of one more step in that uh, in that kind of evolution of how do you gain more space to bring more people together and experience uh, the business activity that you have. Yeah, we did start at the beginning of the pandemic, a parklet program so that people could push outside because yeah, the, the sidewalks aren't that wide in certain parts. So yeah, and that's, and that's worked pretty well to make it permanent. Yeah, you know, I gotta tell you that there talk about a, a silver lining for many of us with with the the pandemic yeah. kind of gave many of us an opportunity to just blow right through some of the typical in, in its bureau, bureaucracy, it's our own bureaucracy that gets in the way of doing some of these great ideas. And we were, you know, collaboratively able to kind of push right through that and say, you know what, these rules are kind of stupid and we're going to find a way to eliminate them or work around them because we have this critical issue and we're going to do it temporarily. Well, by and large, you know what? That was really cool. That worked really well. I think we're going to find a way to do this all the time. Cool. You want to bring um, over Thomas or? Yeah, Thomas, you can go ahead. Yes, a very general question. Uh, obviously, starting Church Street Marketplace in the 1980s, there was no guarantee and it was probably not easy. If someone were talking to you about 
starting something like this in the 2020s, even aside from the pandemic, what would be your, your biggest caution and or advice about what has changed since the 80s? Well, I think, I think it's got to be so much easier today than it was in the 80s. There weren't a lot of good, successful examples that folks had, uh, had experience with. And I think right now, over the course of the last five years, maybe it's 10 years, but irrespective of the pandemic, you're seeing more and more appreciation for the value of pedestrian space. Um, just look at what has happened in New York City with Times Square. I mean, it's, it's almost entirely pedestrian space now. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, such a huge demand for, for that kind of experience, that kind of downtown experience. You look all over Europe, it's everywhere. You know, there, there are, yes, dedicated pedestrian streets, and ours is kind of modeled off of uh, the one in Copenhagen. But, you know, right. whether, it's, uh, whether it's an individual street or it's some sort of a piazza or, uh, or park, um, there are lots of good examples out there. And I would not hesitate uh, to encourage somebody to, to really think about how do, you, um, how do you activate some of these spaces um, if you really want to have a vibrant downtown, that's going to be a really key element to it. Yes, you need to build in kind of the logistics and the infrastructure uh, and kind of the management tools around it operational to operationalize it to be successful. But um, I think there's no better time than now, and particularly now uh, because of the pandemic and people's appreciation for uh, local businesses, uh, outside you know yeah. activities all of those kinds of things a lot of that stuff's not going to go away yeah i agree i think that's to stay and i do think people um the market has changed like just talking about walkable neighborhoods in the early in the 80s that wasn't a conversation right. you know just th some of those things that we you know, talk about it as planners, we didn't talk about in the 80s, you know? Right, so. and you're, you're seeing, you know, this is, a, this is a big phenomenon going right, you know, one of the buzzwords right now is the 15 minute city. You right. Know, the first time I saw the 15 minute city example uh, that they're pursuing in Paris, I'm like, really? We've been doing that in Burlington since the 90s. You know, we have we have what's called neighborhood activity centers that are intended to provide goods and services within, you know, walking and biking dis distance of um, our residential neighborhoods. That's the 15 minute city idea. Yeah, I know. I always joke my favorite zoning district in Bangor is the neighborhood service district, which functions like that. Yeah. To encourage those corner stores. So yeah. it's great. Any other questions? Any other thoughts folks have? All right. Well, David, this was so nice of you to spend your evening with us. Happy and, to. Yeah, it's great. Really Burling to. Burlington's one of my favorite places, so. Well, yeah. mine too, but uh, uh, I'm excited to experience some other places along the way too, and uh, I hope to get out to Bangor, my next time uh, heading to. We'd love it. But we'll give you the grand tour. All right, um, sounds great. And Thank did you. you did you want me to do my little tutorial? Oh yes, oh, yes. <laughs> before we before we sign off, um, I'm gonna have Anya just walk you through um, the the comp plan page on the city's website, and then. But I also also want to interject that next week we are talking about form based codes when David mention form-based codes. Um, that's going to be our topic next week. My friend Dan Tasman from the Ithaca Planning Department is going to talk uh, to us about their form-based code. So go ahead, Anya. Okay. And thank you again, David. Yeah, thank you, David. It's awesome. Um, sorry if any of the attendees have seen this before, but I just like to do a little tutorial of our comp plan site. Um, we want to get as much public feedback on that as possible. So I'm just going to share my screen real quick. Okay, um, 
So if you just go to our main website here and go down to get email updates, you can go to comprehensive plan updates, put in your email address and do join. And we're sending out reminder emails about our lectures every week. And then we're also gonna be sending out um, updates on the comprehensive plan for the rest of the year, as long as that's going on. And then also if you go up here to departments and then planning and then 2022 comprehensive plan, um, we have some forum questions down here. Uh, we wanna get some community discussion going. And then also we have a vision board and interactive map. Um, so these are just some guiding questions here on the left to talk about. And if you just click on one of these, you can put in your comments. And then um, we've got some similar questions on the map here. Um, it, the map is just more spatially oriented. So if you have particular places that you wanna point out, um, we also have all of our old feedback here in purple from the economic development strategy. So we just kind of want people to build on that um, and, and kind of talk more so about things like this as far as land use and whatnot. So uh, that was pretty much it. So go ahead and leave off here. But yeah, just thank you again, uh, David, and thanks to all of our attendees. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.